What's up, math scholars and math haters? This is Mr. W. Today we're going to tackle question two in the math three questions that North Carolina released this past school year. The question gives us this function and tells us that x minus 7 and x plus 4i are factors, and we're supposed to find the total number of real zeros of f of x. Now this question covers a lot of ground. We'll need to know the remainder theorem. We'll need to know how to use synthetic division and even how to use it repeatedly using the different zeros that we get for a polynomial or for a function. And we'll need to know some of the theorems about roots and zeros to know uh, how to fill in some of the gaps that we'll inevitably, inevitably find here. So let's start by just looking at this problem and seeing what we can pick out in terms of the remainder theorem. Now the remainder theorem says that if we're dividing a polynomial by x minus something, uh, the remainder when we divide is the same as the value when we plug just that number a that we're subtracting in that linear factor into the polynomial for x. So as I look at x minus 7, I can see, okay, that's just the number 7. I see x plus 4i, and I say, okay, that's negative 4i. But there's one more thing that I can do, and it's actually going to help me find another 0. Essentially, whenever I see a rational root, like 3 plus the square root of 5, or, um, or even just the square root of 31, I know that these come in pairs. And I know that this is going to have a, I guess, a, a brother or a sister or something, and 3 minus the square root of 5. The square root of 31 will have a brother or sister in negative root 31. And I can even extend this to complex numbers and say that if I have negative 4i, I have to have positive 4i as well. And then if you see something like 2 plus i, 2 minus i has to be one of your zeros as well. Essentially, any possible root that is going to come in a square root or a complex or imaginary number has to have a brother that is its conjugate. Negative 4i and 4i. 2 plus i, 2 minus i. 3 plus the square root of 5, 3 minus the square root of 5, root 31, negative root 31. So that tells me that if I have x plus 4, 4i telling me to test negative 4i, I also have x minus 4i telling me to test 4i. And it's at this point that we need to actually test each of these possible roots out using synthetic division. Now with synthetic division, the idea is that we make a, uh, it's almost a grid type thing like this. And essentially, um, you're welcome to have a look at any of this information, screenshot it, copy it, whatever you want to do. But essentially, the number that we're testing is going to go here. All of the coefficients of my polynomial are going to go across this top row here. And then we're going to do a zigzag where we add and multiply, add and multiply, add and multiply, add until we get some number at the end. And we want this number to be 0 so that we can know that the number we're testing is a 0. And that linear factor is, in fact, a valid linear factor of the polynomial. So let me go ahead and demonstrate that. Um, by actually writing out my polynomial and doing the synthetic division for the real root that we already know, which is 7. This is going to be tight, but I think I'll be able to make it fit. Now, the number that we're testing is the number 7. And this is where I'm going to do my zigzag. I'm going to add, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, until I actually get my answer. Let me make that my answer box. Give myself a little bit more space. All right, so I start with this coefficient of 2, my lead coefficient, the coefficient on my greatest power of x. And I'm going to add as I go down, but I'm adding 2 to just nothing, so that leaves me with 2. And then every time I move up the diagonal, I'm going to multiply whatever number I have down here by this number that I'm testing, which is 7. So 2 times 7 would give me 14. 
negative 13 plus 14, because now that I'm looking at a column of numbers, I'm just going to add them. That gives me positive 1. As I move diagonally now, I want to multiply 1 by 7, which gives me 7. 22 plus 7 is 29. 29 times 7, let me do that one in my calculator. That's 203. And now negative 187 plus 203 will give me positive 16. 16 times 7 is 112. Negative 160 plus 112 is negative 48. For my final diagonal mul multiplication, I multiply 48, or negative 48 by 7. I get negative 336. And now, this is exactly what I wanted, because positive 336 and negative 336 are going to give me 0. And because I got 0 here, I've not only confirmed that 7 is, in fact, a 0 of the polynomial, but I actually now have the coefficients of the next polynomial that I'm going to use to, um, to actually keep dividing out all of these roots here. But you can see that these coefficients, 2, 1, 29, 16, and negative 48, all show up in this polynomial that we say is what happens when we divided our original polynomial by x minus 7. So now we get into the part where we need to talk about repeated synthetic division. And essentially, uh, repeated synthetic division is where I can take these coefficients and keep dividing all of the numbers that I know are roots. So now I'm going to come back to the problem and I'm going to test positive 4i. This is going to look really crazy, but once I divide 4i and negative 4i, I think it'll make a little more sense what we were trying to do. And now, I'm going to zigzag. So as I go down each column, I add 2 plus nothing is 2. As I come up here, I'm going to multiply by 4i. 2 times 4i is the same as 2 times 4, which is 8. And then I tack an i onto that, so that's 8i. 1, no, oh, let me scoot that up and over. And now as I add, this is going to turn into a complex number. One plus 8i. I multiply again by 4i. So now 1 times 4i, I have to kind of distribute this. 1 times 4i is just going to get me positive 4i. But now when I multiply 8i by 4i, that's 32i squared. And if you remember, i squared is another way of saying negative 1. So I replace i squared with a negative sign, and this gives me negative 32 plus 4i. So now um, I add 29 to negative 32 plus 4i. I don't have to worry about adding my complex part of this number, but 29 minus 32 is negative 3, and that gets the plus 4i. Now that I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and distribute again. Negative 3 times 4i is going to be negative 12i. But then 4i times 4i, 4 times 4 is 16i squared. Once again, i squared just becomes a negative sign. So that's negative 16 minus 12i. Now this is looking like it's starting to make a little more sense because I can add 16 to negative 16 and get 0. The minus 12i stays. And now I need to multiply minus 12i by 4i. So this becomes essentially negative 12 times 4 times i squared, because it would be i times i. This all gets me negative 48. i squared is like negative 1. And any negative attached to an already negative number gets rid of it and makes it positive. So this is positive 48, which gives me 0. And now all these look insane, but we're going to do one more synthetic division, and it will actually get rid of all of these. And I'm going to put these right back into another synthetic division. 
So this, this is the idea of repeated synthetic division. It's a process that will work for real and complex numbers alike, and it will allow us to get rid of any roots that we find. And the number that I'm testing now is negative 4i. And now I'm going to zigzag. I add 2 plus nothing equals 2. I multiply 2 times negative 4i equals negative 8i. Now, as I add down this column, positive 8i and negative i are going to cancel, and I'm just left with 1. But then I bring this back up, and it's negative 4i again, because 1 times negative 4i is negative 4i. I bring this all down. Plus 4i and minus 4i cancel, and I get negative 3. I come up here, and this gets me to positive 12i, because negative 3 times negative 4 is positive 12. And now, negative 12i and 12i are going to cancel each other out, and I'm left with zero. I hope that these two synthetic division problems actually serve to show you why we need these complex roots to be conjugates, to be kind of um, additive inverses of each other if we just have the complex part. And I hope that it can um, help you see how synthetic division can be useful in dividing out these, even if it takes a little more time. I still prefer it to polynomial long division under any circumstance possible. There is another question where we will have to do that, unfortunately, coming up. But anyway, this is our new polynomial, 2x squared plus 1x minus 3. So 2x squared plus x minus 3. Now, at this point, we've already figured out, and as we already knew, that 7 is a real root, and that 4i and negative 4i were both complex roots. We're trying to find the total number of real zeros or real roots of this polynomial. And so now, all I have to do, if I see something that looks like a quadratic, I can pull out my discriminant. b squared minus 4ac, which you might remember as part of the quadratic formula. But it's this part inside the square root here, b squared minus 4ac, where this is our a, 1 would be our b, and negative 3 would be our c, that tells me exactly how many real roots, real zeros, I'm going to be able to get from this quadratic. And remember, if it's more than zero, there's two real zeros. If it's equal to zero, there's one real zero with a multiplicity of two. That, that means it shows up twice. If it's less than zero, there's no real roots. They're all complex. So let's go ahead and dig into this quadratic and actually use the discriminant to find the number of real roots. b squared minus 4ac is going to end up looking like 1 squared minus... 4 times 2 times negative 3. So 1 squared is just 1. This will be 1 minus, and then 4 times 2 times negative 3 is negative 24. Subtracting a negative number always turns it into a positive number, so that's 25. Because 25 is greater than 0, we have this real root here, 7, and then we have... these two extra real zeros right here, which gives us a grand total. After all that work, we finally come out with the mathematically profound answer of three. So amazing. But now we do have to actually put this into our gridded response page. So if you take your paper test instead of the computer test, here's what the gridded response box would look like. I would have to write three into the box, find the three bubble below it, and bubble that in. And after all that, that's how we solve a question like this. Now, I will admit that it is possible to just type this function in the calculator using the little caret and 5 for an exponent of 5, caret and 4 for an exponent of 4, and so on. And if we graph it, we can see that this function hits the graph in one, two, three places. However, uh, North Carolina is liable to put a question like this that will trick you, uh, because this could be a root of multiplicity 2 or 3 or something like that um, at any of these points and they, there could be other zeros off the window and just, just all kinds of stuff that they could do. Um, so this could be a good way to check your work and gauge um, how many zeros you have visually, but doing the work of synthetic division or polynomial long division or something is, in my opinion, the best way to go for a question like this.